I always love it when game developers throw in unconventional weapons and equipment that are just so out of place compared to everything else you find in the game. You don't see this too often anymore, but during their heyday, Konami did this with almost all of their games, including Castlevania. In Aria of Sorrow, you had the handgun, silver gun, and the positron rifle. Then in Dawn of Sorrow, you had the ladder two and the rocket launcher. And in Curse of Darkness, you have the Gatling gun, probably the most out of place weapon in the series. For the Sorrow duology, at least those games were set in the future. Curse of Darkness, on the other hand, is set in the year 1479. Granted, in context, the Gatling gun in Curse of Darkness actually does make some sense. First of all, it's heavily implied that in the world of Castlevania, Dracula and the other night creatures have access to advanced technology that is being forbidden and censored by the church. Second of all, Hector is a devil forge master, meaning he has the ability to craft weapons that cannot be forged by conventional means. And third of all, one of the materials you need to make it, you have to get from Saint Germain, who is not only a time traveler, but he also uses a gun in his boss fight. And it's also probably the hardest weapon to craft in the game. Not only can you miss it, you probably will unless you're making obtaining it one of your goals from the start of the game. Still though, out of all the weapons they could have chosen, having a minigun does seem like kind of a weird choice, but it's definitely a fun weapon to use, and a powerful one but still less than ideal for use as anything other than a novelty. For one thing, you can't even legitimately obtain it until you're three quarters of the way through the game, but it also takes like a full second to pull out and put away, which you have to do every single time you attack with it, you can't aim up or down, you can't shoot in the air, and it takes forever to actually aim at targets unless you're already facing them when you start attacking. It has an aim assist kind of like Shadow the Hedgehog where it'll automatically lock on to the nearest enemy, but like I said, Adjusting to your next target is very slow, and can really pose a problem when there are multiple enemies on screen. Which there usually are, and you can forget about hitting flying enemies or enemies that are stuck to the wall. So, of course, beating the game with only this weapon sounds like a perfect idea for a Can You Beat video. Although, like my Bloodstained Lily Only video, this is somewhat a challenge run, somewhat an easy mode run, but mostly one that I'm doing as a joke, because I just love the idea of Hector going around Wallachia in the year 1479, mowing down everything with this modern firearm that won't be invented for another half a millennium. Before we get started, let's lay down our list of rules. I am only allowed to use the Gatling gun when fighting enemies, which I have to use a cheat code to get because there is no other way to start the game with it. The only way I could do this is by using a code that gives me 99 of every weapon, and there's no way for me to get rid of them without selling them. So. This will pose some complications with crafting because some of the armor pieces do require weapons as ingredients. What I'm going to do is I'm going to make it so that where for those, I can only craft them after I have the materials I need to craft those weapons. Then I'll just craft them from the weapons in my inventory. Also, it was kind of difficult for me to come to a conclusion on what to do for innocent devils. I would hate to play through the game without them because they are one of my favorite things about this game but there's also the fact that they are required in some parts, and I'm already at a huge disadvantage with my only weapon being the Gatling gun, so I'm just gonna go ahead and allow them. A decision that I hope I don't regret later. Without further ado, let's get started. So, as usual with these kind of videos, we start out with the intro, choose new game, get some opening exposition, get the introductory cutscene where Hector and Isaac say they're going to get revenge against each other, and now we can begin. If you turn around here and follow the path backwards, you'll be able to get a Moai if you have a Lament of Innocence save file on your memory card, which I don't, so I just equip my Gatling gun and head right in, where I am immediately ambushed by an Executioner, and he just gets annihilated by my machine gun and that's kind of how this first section goes in general. Whenever I get to a room full of enemies, I just hold down the square button and let the aim assist do most of the work. Sometimes I do have to stop what I'm doing to get a better spot to shoot from, or I may get knocked around by some of the enemies, but this early in the game, this isn't much of a problem. Plus, in the areas that are long hallways, I can easily shoot the enemies from a distance before they can reach me, and there are a lot of those sections here. A little further in, and I meet Zed, and get my first innocent devil, this one being the fairy type, and because I'm such a dork, I'm gonna name them all after s &T demons, and this one I'm going to name Pixie. I make my way into the caves, and everything goes fine until I get to this area where I'm supposed to break a pillar to bring down part of the ceiling so that I can move up. But, no matter how much I shoot at it, it will not come down. The aim assist is locking onto it, so I know that the game recognizes this as something I need to break, but... 
it just doesn't work. I assume this is because I'm not supposed to have this weapon this early in the game, but whatever the case, I just unequip my Gatling gun and just break it down with my fists. As long as I'm not attacking enemies, I think this is okay, and I keep moving further into the castle. There's not much to say about this next part. It's mostly just me cartwheeling through a network of hallways linked together by these square rooms where I have to fight enemies before I can move on. The only enemies that really gave me any trouble are the bone dragons which are stuck to the wall. I can hit them, but I have to wait till their heads are close to the ground, and this takes quite a while, but once I'm past that, I can fight the first boss, and it just gets shredded. But oh wait, it has a second form, and uh, nope, that one gets shredded too. Well, that was pretty easy. We take the birdcage elevator thing outside, get the battle type ID, which I name Agni, and then head to the next area, the Bulget Mountains, where the enemies are no more of a problem than they were before. But what is a problem is the layout of the area. Here, there are a lot more slopes and slants, which makes hitting the enemies with my machine gun much more difficult since I can't aim up. The only way I can hit them is by either shooting them from the side on the same level or by just standing at the top or bottom and waiting for them to come to me. A little ways in, I meet Julia, who is going to be supplying me with items and taking care of my IDs. Now, eventually I get to this part where I'm supposed to use a turret to knock down a wooden barrier. There's a skeleton operating the turret, which I can't take out with my gun, but I can take it out with my battle type ID. And before resorting to using the turret to break down the barrier, I want to see if I can bring it down with just my weapon. And yes, I can, although it does take some time because I have to deal with not only the turrets, but also the orcs shooting arrows at me, and the knights that spawn, but eventually I do move on. And at the top of the mountain, I have to fight the wyvern. And this boss is also pretty easy. It attacks with a variety of moves you probably expect a wyvern to use, like fire breath, biting, tail whipping, and even a headbutt that leaves its head lodged into the ground. None of these attacks have long range, and while it's on the ground, you can easily shoot at its feet for damage, although the hitbox is somewhat inconsistent. When it gets close, just move back a little and start shooting again. The only times you won't be able to hit it are when it starts flying, but its attacks from the air are really easy to dodge, though it does spend a good amount of time in the air when it flies, which just drags the fight on. Other than that, there's not much to say. Just shoot at it when it's on the ground and avoid it while it's in the air, and this fight will be over in no time. Next, I have to head to the Garibaldi Temple, where, outside, I'm greeted by Saint Germain, who tells me not to get involved, which I happily ignore and keep going further into the temple. The temple is actually much easier than the mountains, mainly because we're fighting on mostly flat surfaces again, though there are some annoying new enemies, like the Fleamen and the Blazemasters, which all annoyingly jump all over the place, and the lesser demons, which fly around and are only vulnerable when they swoop down to attack. The real toughest enemy, though, is the boss. None other than Trevor Belmont himself, although he's still actually not really tough. Trevor is a small target and moves around pretty fast, but when your attacks land, they will temporarily stunlock him for a good number of hits until he backflips and goes for his holy water attack, which is easy to get hit by, but it doesn't deal a whole lot of damage. His other attacks are also very easy to dodge. If it's your first time playing, you may be a little concerned by how slow his health bar goes down, but don't worry. You only need to get his blue health bar down by like a quarter, and after that, the fight will stop. So Trevor lets us go, and now we can move on. But before I do, there is one important item in here that I want to get. The ceremonial tool, which allows me to create the sports kit. The first of many armor pieces that actually give me a boost to strength. Which is the only way I can increase the power of my weapon. Right? Well, anyway, I get the Brute Force ability from my Battle ID, which lets me open the door to the Mortvia Aqueduct, which, like the temple, is a mostly flat area, only there are less jumpy and floating enemies here. In fact, if you ask me, this is the best area in the game for the Gatling Gun, because this area is filled with these long hallways that are ideal for it. It's hilarious just standing in the back and unloading into these mermen while they helplessly move toward me. At least, this is the case for the first part. Once you get to the underground part, the hallways are shorter, there are more combat rooms, and more staircases. Though, I wouldn't say it's as bad as the mountains. There's also this one area where I have to use a turret to knock down a tower to form a bridge to the next part of the aqueduct. And yes, I did try to look for a workaround, and I could not find one. So, I do have to make an exception, but at least here I'm still using a gun. Anyway, it's not long before I get to the boss, the Skeleton Diver. 
This one I was a bit worried about because of its movement pattern, but when I get there, I quickly realize that there isn't much to worry about. This boss rides on a skeletal shark and likes to swim around and throw spears at you. I was worried because this boss moves considerably faster than the others and is constantly alternating between attacking while on and off his pet shark. Sometimes he'll hop off and attack you while his shark spits water at you, sometimes he'll move across your little island with his shark and try to hit you, and sometimes he'll circle around and throw spears. None of these attacks are strong, but they do make for very small windows to hit him, at least without getting hit yourself. Sometimes it's better just keep firing for as long as you can and just take the hit. My pixie helps with healing, and if you are able to somehow hit the skeleton diver's weak spot while he's on land, you could briefly stunlock him, but don't rely on this because of how difficult it is to hit him like this. I'd say the best time to hit him is when he's circling around you and throwing his spears in the air, because this is the only opportunity you really get to deal sufficient damage while also being able to dodge his attacks in time. Either way, my gun is still doing a decent amount of damage to him, so just keep up the pressure and before you know it, he'll be defeated. Once you beat him, you get the bird type ID, which lets you fly across the gap to the next area, the Forest of Jigramun. This area is also pretty easy due to it being mostly flat, and there are plenty of places that are perfect for unloading on the enemies. This is where the game starts to throw bigger enemies at you though, like the assassin zombies and the red ogres, which don't flinch and take quite a lot of bullets to take out, but they're not too much of a challenge. The most interesting thing about this area though is the Tower of Eternity. This is a 50 floor gauntlet of enemies, and you see pretty much every kind of enemy you've encountered up until this point in the game. It not only has a pretty awesome reward at the top, but it's also a great place to grind for EXP, crystals, and even materials. Most of the early floors go pretty smoothly. As soon as I enter, I just start holding down square, and the enemies start dropping like flies. Although, rather than focusing on a single target, I kind of just spray the bullets around to stagger them before they get to me. Only a few times do I actually have to move away before I start firing again. At least, that's the case for the earlier floors. Once you get about halfway up, the game will start throwing stronger enemies and more flying enemies at you. Which is a problem, but at least my innocent devils can help me fight those. Right? Well, yes, but only if they're actually alive when you need them. It's easy to forget that innocent devils can take damage too, and it only takes a few hits for the enemies to take them out. Plus, there's the fact that hearts function as both their life bar and their MP gauge. Most of the flying enemies I am still able to take out with my gun when they swoop down, except for the elemental demons. These enemies don't appear until you get very close to the top, and the first few I am able to take out, but when I get to the 38th floor, the one with the ice demons, they take out my bird, and there is nothing I can do. These are the only enemies that I am just straight up unable to hit at all with my machine gun. I'm at the second to final floor, and I've hit a roadblock. The only thing left to do now is escape with a magical ticket and come back later when I have better devils. I decide to go further into the forest, into the underground cave, where you might notice this part with these statues lined up like bowling pins. Well, if you have the Ite Innocent Devil, which I do because all my crystals so far have been white, you can use his unique ability, Shoulder Ride, to knock these pins down and access an optional area where you get a Dragon Scale and a Rare Ring. After that, it isn't long before I have to fight the Minotaur. Now this is just what I want from a boss. A big, flat arena with a giant boss that is feet on the ground. The Minotaur boss fight plays exactly how you would expect him to. He moves around very slowly, he's a big target, but his attacks hit like a truck, making it dangerous to get close to him to attack, which we don't have to do because we have a minigun. However, I do still die on my first attempt because I try to steal from him, which I can't seem to do for some reason. But anyway, like I said, the Minotaur is a very melee-focused boss. Big, strong, but also very slow. He primarily attacks by picking up pillars and using them as weapons. When you get close, he'll swing them around, but if you're far away, he'll throw them at you. These throws are very predictable and easy to dodge, even with the added weight of my gun. And when he's walking around to pick up the next one, this is a great opportunity to get some hits in. Once he runs out of pillars, his attack pattern will change. Now, instead of throwing pillars when you get far away enough, he'll either swing his pillar around while spinning or jump towards you. This jumping attack is also pretty easy to dodge, but it's also your only window to steal from him, which gives you the Devil Iron. This is one of the permanently missable materials in the game, and this is the only opportunity you have to get it. 
and you'll need it to create the Hien, which you need to create the Gatling gun. It's not going to be any use to me in this run, but I do still want to steal it just for the novelty. Once I do get it, I just focus on attacking him. Even though he has access to more attacks, this fight doesn't really get any harder, and I have plenty of opportunities to hit him. It does take a little longer than the other fights, mainly because this boss has the highest defense of any boss I've faced so far, with my bullets only doing 5 damage with each hit, but without too much trouble, I am able to take out the Minotaur. After that, we enter my favorite area in the game, Gordova Town, mainly because of the music, but also partially because this is another great area for the Gatling gun. Long hallways and lots of enemies to gun down. Once I've laid waste to every zombie, skeleton, dead fencer, and every other enemy that spawns in Cordova Town, I get to the underground area and come across a great place for farming assassin zombies. Why am I farming assassin zombies? Well, they're the only enemies that drop the Jade material, which I need to create the face guard, the first piece of headgear that increases my strength. Once I've got that, I decide I've done enough messing around and go to fight none other than Isaac. And he's a complete joke. The fight against Isaac is very similar to the one against Trevor, only much easier because unlike Trevor, he has no way to break out of his stun lock. As long as you keep hitting Isaac with a stream of bullets, he cannot do anything. If he does break out, well, it's not because of him, it's because the terrain is messing with the aim assist, which tends to happen against these small target enemies, but in case he does manage to break out, all you have to do is readjust your aim and start shooting again. The only thing you have to worry about is his innocent devil, but assuming you're using one, it'll be too busy fighting yours. It only becomes a problem when and if your innocent devil runs out of hearts, which mine does, and this gives Isaac the opportunity to land a few hits, but after this, I just bring out my battle type and start blasting him again until he goes down. The battle ends with Julia interrupting, and then Isaac leaves. And then I go a little further and get the mage type innocent devil, who I normally name Vivi, but since Vivi isn't an SMT demon, I name him... Oberon, because I can't think of another one that looks like him. But crappy nicknames aside, I think now is a good time to attempt the Tower of Eternity again. This time it goes much more smoothly than the last attempt because I'm higher level, my innocent devils are higher level, and when I get to the upper floors, I actually have enough hearts to take out the demons. And once I'm past the 49th floor and reach the top, I get the kit bag which allows me to equip a third accessory. Not bad at all. There's not much else I can do up here though, so all I do is just jump down. With that finished, I head to the next area by using the mage type's time stop ability. And this is where things are starting to get difficult. There are even more flying, jumping, and tough enemies here than any other area so far, including these iron gladiators that can stun Hector with their attacks. There's also this part where you have to move an elevator up by manually rotating the gears by attacking them, which, get this, actually does work when shot by the Gatling gun, but that gear you have to break to move on past a supposed dead end? Nah, you gotta use your fist for that. At the top, we have to fight Saint Germain, who is probably the hardest boss so far. Unlike Trevor and Isaac, Saint Germain has the ability to teleport. His attack pattern is very predictable, but with the way he moves and teleports around, it's very easy to accidentally start firing in the wrong direction when trying to attack. At the very least, I am dealing 10 damage with each hit, but I can't do any cheesy stun-locking exploits like I did in the last fight. Saint Germain attacks by swinging his sword at you after teleporting. Usually three, but sometimes two times. And the third one will always have this poison effect. The only other attacks he uses are the ones where he'll stop time. The only way to counter this is by having your mage-type devil use the time stop ability, which will not only cancel out this effect, but it will also allow you to steal from him and the material you get is the Immortal Fragment. Another one-time only material and another one that's necessary to get the Gatling Gun. Which I once again steal for novelty, but anyway, this attack is easily counterable early on, but the time stop effect is a pretty costly one, and you're probably not going to have enough hearts to counter every single one. For one of these attacks, he'll bring up lava from the ground, which you can avoid by just jumping, but his other one, where he'll charge at you and swing his sword, I have no idea how you're supposed to dodge that. Sometimes backflipping works, but sometimes it doesn't. And you have to avoid this thorny vine that comes up from the ground. While this is active, well, you can forget about hitting him. But at least it doesn't last long. 
Saint Germain is also pretty tanky, making this whole boss fight just one big endurance test. If that wasn't bad enough, once you think you've taken him out, he'll regain half of his health. He'll also pull out his gun, and as you might expect, this projectile hits instantly and you have to dodge at just the right time. By the time I reach the second phase of this fight, I am extremely low on resources because of how much I fumbled in the first phase. And, for that same reason, I'm just frustrated and slip up even more in the second phase. By the time I do beat him, I am clean out of healing items with no hearts, making this fight extremely close, but somehow, I am able to finish him off. I surrender. After that, I get the Devil-type Innocent Devil and use its ability to get to the next area, the Eilon Ruins, which in structure is pretty similar to the underground section of the forest, but with tougher enemies. At the end of the area, we catch the middle of a fight between Hector and Isaac, followed by Zed, who tells us where he is. Then, we're automatically taken to the abandoned castle, where, in the room we fought the first boss, there's now a staircase that leads us to the room where we have to fight Trevor again. Only this time, he is much stronger. Not only do we have to get his entire health bar down this time, but his attacks are more powerful, he has more moves, and he no longer flinches when attacked. Well, sometimes he does, but throughout most of the fight, he has this little green aura around him, and while that's active, he won't flinch. But worst of all, my attacks are are doing one damage. That's kind of an issue considering how small my attack window is. Innocent devils aren't really helping much either because of how easily they go down. I try equipping my two strength boosting armor pieces, but they don't make a difference in this fight. In fact, I'm not even sure if they're making difference period, but I'll get back to that soon. Right now, this battle is just not going to be possible under these conditions, so what can I do? Well, remember how OP the Lubicon soul was in Aria of Sorrow? The one that increased your strength the lower your HP got? Well, Curse of Darkness does have one like it. It's the Megging Jord, but here it's hidden behind an area that you can only get if you have the Proboscis Fairy. And I can't get that with nothing but white crystals. And because with the Gatling Gun I can only get white crystals, that's off the table. Right? Well... Even though my rules don't let me attack enemies with other weapons, I never actually made any rules against equipping them. When enemies are defeated, they always drop colored crystals based on the weapon you had equipped when you defeated them, but the game doesn't actually care how you defeated them. I can get different colored crystals by equipping a different weapon, then killing enemies with my innocent devil and picking up the crystals, but unfortunately the fairy type devil doesn't have much in the way of offense so what i have to do is use one of my other devils to kill the enemies then pause the game switch to my fairy type and then pick up the crystals after getting the extra id pocket and a fairy id egg i do this until my fairy evolves into the lethal and thankfully after that i can evolve it into a proboscis fairy with nothing but white crystals and that's exactly what i do then i take it to the ruins where it knocks down the walls by pushing a small button opening a secret area where I can get the Megging Jord. Although, it's also at this point I begin to question if my strength boosting equipment is even making a difference at all. I mean, the game is telling me that my attack is being increased in the pause screen, but I tested it with and without my strength boosting equipment and it doesn't make a difference with my Gatling gun, leading me to believe that this weapon deals fixed damage. However, I then let my HP go down to test my new accessory and... This one actually does increase my damage. So, is this a programming oversight, or is my equipment just not helping enough to make a difference? Well, there's no way to know right now, but what I do know is that even at low health, with this accessory equipped, I'm still only doing one damage per shot to Trevor. There is only one thing left to do, and I was hoping it wouldn't come to this, but I'm going to have to start relying on my Innocent Devils. First, I need to get the Innocent Supporter, which I get from the Eilon Ruins by blasting this wall. And what this does is it increases the number of hearts your IDs consume when using their moves. And with that, I think I'm ready to fight Trevor. Not really. Like I said before, there's not much I can do to make this fight go any faster. My Gatling Gun is only dealing one damage to him, and throughout 90% of the fight, he doesn't flinch. I do have my Innocent Devils, which can help me though, but not as much as I was hoping. My strongest attack from them is my mage type's Agnia, which hits multiple times and deals 16 damage with each hit. It's not too costly either, but against Trevor's 4700 HP, this is nothing. Then there's my bird type, whose best attack is Sphere of Darkness, but his attacks aren't quite as powerful, 
and his other ones are much more costly. Then there's the battle type who's powerful, but with him being stuck to the ground, he's a sitting duck to Trevor's attacks and goes down before I can really get any use out of him. When all my fighting innocent devils are gone, Trevor is at a little over half of his health, which doesn't sound bad, but I still have a long fight ahead of me. The only thing I can do now is just be patient and attack during the extremely small windows I have to hit him. Trevor spends most of the fight swinging around his whip, and if you want to avoid all of his attacks, you pretty much have to keep dodging while he's doing that. If you're lucky, you'll get around 11 or 12 hits during each of these windows, but most of the time it'll only be around 8 or 9. And Trevor, like I said, has 4700 HP. I'll let you do the math yourself. Point is, this is a long battle. At the very least, he's not doing much damage to me either, and with two healers, I don't have much to worry about. My Proboscis Fairy is proving to be especially helpful with his time heal ability, which hardly uses up any hearts and easily heals off most of the damage Trevor can do, Plus, every time I perfect guard one of his attacks, I get some hearts restored, so I could pretty much farm infinite heals this way. But even that still doesn't make the fight what I would call easy, and toward the end, I start to get impatient. By the end, I'm just scraping by with what little hearts I have, and I'm just worn out. This whole battle takes about 40 minutes, but somehow I am successful. I hope I never have to do that again. So Trevor opens up the way to the infinite corridor, which is probably the worst area in the game for the Gatling gun. It's full of slopes, staircases, and lots of flying enemies. Not to mention the final guards that can block your attacks, though ironically this is actually the first area in the game where you're able to legitimately use the Gatling gun. At the very least, I do have my innocent devils to help me out, and my mage type's Agnia is working wonders. But, unless I'm in an area that actually requires me to beat all the enemies to move on, I just end up running past most of them. About halfway in, I get to this elevator which brings me to an area with a lot of valuable materials. And after that, I decide to leave and create a new bird-type innocent devil. And then, using the same grinding loophole I used earlier to get the proboscis fairy, I evolve him into a wingasaurus. Why am I doing this? Well, I need him for the long glide ability. At the top of the Tower of Eternity, you may have noticed another tower in the distance. Well, you can actually reach it with the Long Glide ability, but before I can get there, I first have to fight my way through the tower again, which is much easier this time, thankfully. Once you fly across, you'll be at the Tower of Evermore, which is basically the same thing as the Tower of Eternity, only now you're going down, and the enemies here are much tougher. Like, you'll start seeing enemies in the 70s level range, but that also means more experience and better rewards. Plus. I still have my mage-type Innocent Devil to help me out with his Agnia skill. This one does take a lot longer than the other tower did my first time, but after a while, I do make it to the bottom. And my reward is the Vampire Blood, and on the very bottom floor is a Golden Skeleton. These are the toughest enemies in the game. Not in terms of power, but in terms of HP. They have 12,000 HP, so as soon as you see one, just start holding down square and be patient really patient. Actually, do more than be patient. Go get a drink or something, or put on a TV show. Once I do defeat him, I'm rewarded with a miracle egg, and now I gotta break a wall to get out. And, oh, look at that! This wall is able to be broken by my machine gun. Where was I? Oh yeah. With this, there is one more material I need to gather, that being Midas' gold, and with it, I can create the Prince's clothes, and then Dracula's clothes, which is arguably the best armor in the game, because it increases my strength by 10. So, does that make enough of a difference for my gun to deal extra damage? Nope. Well, there is also a helmet that does the same, that being Masakado's helm, which I also have the materials to make, and does this work? No, it does not. And that leads me to the conclusion that the Gatling gun does indeed deal fixed damage, and that the Megging Jord working on it was what I can only assume was an oversight. There isn't really much reason for me to use these armor pieces anymore, but with all the effort I went through to get them, I might as well keep them for novelty. Anyway, I do a little bit of messing around in the Infinite Corridor, and the last boss was a tough customer, so I'm expecting that this next one is going to be harder, right? Uh, nope. He is a much bigger target, he's slower, and best of all, he doesn't take just one damage from my attacks. In fact, he doesn't take any less than 20 with each hit, 
which is great. Now, the Dolahan fights kind of how you would expect him to, just a heavy sword fighter, although his attacks aren't actually that strong, and they come out extremely slowly and give you plenty of time to attack. His two worst attacks are the one where he strikes the ground with a shockwave, and the one where he creates a laser and spins around. But even then, neither of these attacks are really a problem. The laser one just forces you to play a short game of jump rope, and like I said, hardly deals any damage. The Earthquake one is probably the hardest to dodge because in order to completely avoid it, you have to jump at just the right time and then double jump at just the right time too. If you mess up either of these jumps, you're going to take one hit, but once the attack is finished, you have plenty of time to attack him back. This fight is so easy, I don't even need to use my Innocent Devil, although he does pitch in, in fact he actually makes a good distraction as sometimes the boss will try to attack him instead and fail. One thing I should also mention is that this boss has another one-time only material that you need to steal, that being the purple glitter, which is necessary to get the laser blade, which is arguably the best weapon in the game, and I do try to steal it for a while, but it's pretty difficult, and had I not wasted my time trying to get it, this fight wouldn't have taken anywhere near as long as it did, so toward the end, I just give up and finish him off, seeing as how I'm already almost done with the game anyway. Meanwhile, thousands of miles away, defeating the boss causes the return of Dracula's castle. Trevor gets stabbed in the back by Isaac, and then we head on over. Dracula's castle is actually very similar in design to the abandoned castle, just not abandoned. And that means there are plenty of long hallways to shoot enemies in. Same with open arenas. In fact, Dracula's castle is by far the largest area in the game. Before getting to the end, you have to climb up several floors connected by these hallways and open areas. It really is the final test of your combat skills before the end of the game. Just before the rooms where you fight the bosses, you may come across this innocent devil room with a devil that doesn't automatically join when you enter. That's because you need the pumpkin mace, which is not easy to get. In order to get it, you need to combine a pico pico hammer with a pumpkin head. And both of these things require miracle eggs, which isn't a non-renewable resource, but it is one of the hardest ones in the game to get. There is one on the basement floor of Dracula's castle, but I still need one more. Now, there's supposed to be a rare drop from evil cores, which spawn in the area just outside the room where you fight the Legion, but I have to have killed at least a thousand of these things, and I didn't see a single one. And this is with the rare ring, mind you. My only other option is to get one from another golden skeleton, but these only have a very small chance of spawning outside the save room in the Balgit Mountains. So, I just try re-entering over and over, and what do you know, it actually does work. But now I have to kill the skeleton, so that's going to take a while. With that, I can create the pumpkin mace. Except I actually can't, because with the cheat code I've been using, I already have 99 of them. But now that I can legitimately obtain the thing, I whack the pumpkin with it and get the last and only optional innocent devil in the game. Now, the pumpkin-type devils don't do anything on their own, and their stats are atrocious, but they do provide significant stat increases to Hector. But, given how easily they go down, they're not really worth it if you ask me. I got this one mainly just because I wanted to show it off to you, but also for the extra slot. I do a bit more farming for some angel halos so that I can craft the best defensive armor in the game, and with that, I think we're ready to face the final bosses. The first one being, as you probably expected, Isaac. Yeah, this is going to be one of those fights. When Isaac gets hit by my bullets, he flinches, much like in the last fight, only this time he doesn't actually start out with his innocent devil. Much like in the last fight, it is very easy to have Isaac escape your gunfire, but if you manage to knock him back into just the right spot, this won't happen. And that's exactly what I'm able to do. Isaac may only be taking one damage with each hit, but he's also infinitely stunlocked. And as long as he's stunlocked, he can't summon his innocent devil or start the next phase of the fight. So, yeah, just hold down square and be patient. Very patient. Very patient. After Isaac's entire anatomy has been replaced with lead bullets, it's revealed that this whole thing was a plot by Zed, who is actually Death, 
to have Hector give in to the curse so that he can resurrect Dracula. But since Hector never actually gave in, he uses Isaac instead, and now we have to fight him. Now, given the design of this boss, I was kind of hoping that I could just stand in the back and shoot him, but that doesn't work. It actually looks like Hector is aiming at the ground. I tried standing from the elevated areas in the back, but that doesn't seem to work either. I don't know what it is, but it seems like there's something wrong with the aim assist when using it against death. And it seems like the only place I can actually hit him is very close to his body. But once again, we're back to doing just one damage. And death has 6700 HP. His attacks aren't particularly strong, but without any hit stun or anything, combined with how far back I get sent when I'm hit, I don't know if this is going to be in the cards. I mean, I can have my innocent devils help me, which isn't technically against the rules, but I don't know, part of me feels kind of bad about doing this, but it's too late to go back and change the rules now. My mage type's Agnia is once again proving to be my best attack, with it hitting multiple times and dealing 47 damage with each hit. That's still a small amount against death though, considering that he is the toughest enemy we face so far. Well, besides the golden skeletons, but the point is, I don't have an infinite supply of hearts. Death attacks by either shooting sickles at you, swinging his scythe in a wavy pattern, grabbing with this weird invisible hand thing, and later on he'll summon some fire from the ground and create a blast that covers almost the entire battlefield. None of the earlier attacks are particularly strong, but the most annoying one is probably the sickle barrage because you have to repeatedly dodge left and right, and if your timing is off, you're taking a hit, which will trigger a chain reaction causing you to probably get hit by all the others. On the plus side, death doesn't move around, so your attacks will pretty much always hit, and yeah, not much else to say. If I had to describe a strategy, it's just play this boss fight like you would a boss in a Megami Tensei game. Dodge his attacks and protect the protagonist as best you can, and let your innocent devils do most of the work. That big blast attack I mentioned does deal a lot of damage, but at least it's pretty easy to dodge. For Hector, anyway. Chances are your innocent devils are probably going to get caught in the blast, which is exactly what happens to Oberon, so he's out of commission a little early. At this point, Death has about half of his yellow bar, so I pull out my bird type, but he gets caught in the blast again, but now Death is even closer to, well, Death. So I bring out my battle type and finish him off with a few hip presses. We can then move on to the final boss, who is none other than Dracula himself. But the question is, how much damage will I be doing against Dracula? The answer is... One. Again. And that's when I'm able to hit him. Dracula likes to teleport around, and when he's not doing that, he's blocking my bullets. At the very least, his attacks are pretty easy to dodge. He has this one heat vision attack where the ground will erupt in this wavy pattern. He has this one where he'll try to hug you and suck your blood. One where he'll shoot some exploding balls of energy at you and then one where he'll shoot spikes at you from the ground, and this seems to be his favorite one. The real challenge here isn't dodging the attacks, it's dodging them and then finding the right time to attack. My innocent devils aren't as helpful either because of how much he moves around. That is, while he's moving. While I can't stun lock Dracula when he takes damage, I can lock him into his blocking animation with my Gatling gun, and while he's doing this, he can't do anything else, and while I can't deal damage to him myself, my devil still can't. That's right, while Dracula is busy blocking my bullets, he's vulnerable to other attacks. So, I just bring out my battle type and finish him off once again with a few hit presses. I like to call this the gunlock strategy, and it doesn't even use up that many of my hearts. Although, I do recommend doing this with the battle type since it's not going to be much use to you in the next battle. Power of darkness. And yeah. We do have to fight another form of Dracula after this one. For this phase, you're on this little floating island in the middle of what looks like a visualization for Windows Media Player, and Dracula likes to fly around. If you were hoping that maybe the game would give you a break and allow the Gatling gun to deal more than one damage, you're gonna be disappointed. At the very least, Dracula's attacks are easy to dodge, and you don't really have to worry about the trail they leave because we can attack him from a distance. And yeah, that's one of the things that normally makes this fight so hard. Not only do Dracula's attacks hit like a truck, 
but they also leave behind this floating trail of blood that you have to dodge. But this doesn't mean much when you're only dealing one damage with each hit. Once again, I'll need some help from my innocent devils, but here, they're much more vulnerable to Dracula's attacks. In fact, so am I. I'm going to need to do some more preparing before I have a legitimate chance at this fight, but thankfully, I don't need to do much. I do put away my pumpkin-type innocent devil since I doubt he's really going to be much help, and I instead make a new mage-type, which I evolve into a twinkle-type, mainly for his twinkle star attack, an attack that is decently powerful and deals light damage. I also grind him a bit, attempt Dracula again, get through his first phase with the gunlock strategy, and then get to the second. Once again, I start blasting, but this doesn't do much with only one damage. But, I also start raining stars on him with my Innocent Devil. Twinkle Star is a somewhat costly attack, and it's not the most accurate either, but it is a light attribute attack, which Dracula is weak to, and... Just look at that damage. That's the most I've done with any attack so far. By the time he's out of commission, Dracula has lost a little over half of his blue health bar. And then, I bring out my bird type. And he does... Not a lot. Yeah, he's not very helpful, so I then bring out my other bird type, and is he any better? Um, no, not really. The bird types aren't really focused on dealing damage like the mage types are, so yeah. Now it's time to pull out my old crystal rod with Agnia, and yeah, this attack is proving to be very helpful, as usual. Multiple hits with 35 damage, and not too heavy on the cost of hearts either. By this point, the battle is already almost over, so I easily finish him off with a few Agnias. The transformation. Was it not complete? So well, that was kind of anticlimactic, for a final boss anyway. Dracula dies, the castle crumbles, and Julia low-key asks Hector out, and then we get some foreshadowing from Saint Germain about a game we'll probably never get. Though I hope to God Konami proves me wrong with all the new stuff they've been doing. I mean, it seems like they're trying to make a comeback. But yeah, after that, the credits roll. So, can you beat Castlevania Curse of Darkness with only the Gatling gun? Well, it's another one of those questions where the answer could either be yes or no, depending on how you look at it. There were a few parts where I had to briefly unequip the Gatling gun to move on, and then a few other parts where I didn't have to, but it did make things more convenient, and then there's the fact that I allowed Innocent Devils to be used. I didn't actually think that they would make that much of a difference, but they are one of the most fun aspects about this game, and I didn't want to leave them out. But let me know what you guys think. As usual, be sure to rate, comment, and subscribe. Check out my other links in the description, and until the next video, I will see you all later.